Hey everybody, welcome back to your small group and uh, welcome back to uh, what I think is the final session of Challenges to Christianity, although who knows, I might uh, add to it again at, uh, at some point, but uh, as far as I know, <laughs> this is the, the end of it and I appreciate you hanging in till the end. Hope you found this addition of naturalism to, uh, to be helpful uh, to you and um, you know, I, I, like I said at the start, I think it's really, really relevant for just, you know, being the church in the society that we're in today. So remember, as we talked about a Christian worldview, we talked about the creation, fall, uh, redemption, and then restoration. And so really what we want to focus on in this last session is the idea of re redemption and restoration with, with the idea of the afterlife added in there as well. And so we talk about redemption or, or, or salvation. It's the idea that God had to rescue us from our sin in, in the person of Jesus Christ, that the cross was God's great rescue uh, mission. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone uh, should boast. And so when we talk about salvation, we're talking about the fact that salvation is to be rescued from death uh, to life. Now, rescue is the meaning of the word saved. And we looked at last time the fact that earlier in Ephesians 2, the Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. And, and so, you know, when you put all this together, uh, you see why these worldview kind of issues are important. Because if, um, if, if we're naturally good, why do we need a Savior? Someone thinks they're good, how, why would they respond to the gospel? So, uh, you know, the old school East Tennessee preachers used to say, you got to get them lost before you get, get, you get them saved. And so uh, this factors into that. But, you know, if we're not sinners in need of a Savior, then, you know, there's a sense in which uh, we can kind of have a secular salvation, what M Mark Sayers calls a king, kingdom without a king, uh, where it's more of like a life improvement kind of thing. You don't need a savior, you need a life coach. That common in our society today, you know, you be the best you you can be. You make the life that, that you want to have. Uh, you find, uh, you know, success and fulfillment and meaning in, in, in what you do and what you have and what you experience and, and all these kind of things. And I'm not saying those are just like completely bad, but do we actually need a Savior or not? And, and this is where this becomes you know, really relevant to how we think and how we live and to our witness as, as the church of, of Jesus Christ. So the point of Ephesians chapter 2, though, is that we are hopeless, helpless sinners, dead under the wrath of God, but God, not us, but God, who's rich in grace and mercy, who loves us, uh, came to rescue us from our sins, dying uh, for us in our place to glorify himself and, and, and to bless us that, uh, you know, salvation is past, present and future. We uh, were justified at the moment of, of salvation. We're delivered from the penalty of sin. We're being sanctified, being delivered from the power of sin. Someday we're going to be glorified, eternally delivered from the very presence of sin, conformed into the image of Christ. That's what it means uh, to be saved. Uh, you know, when the New Testament uses save or saved or salvation. Sometimes it's referring to justification, sometimes to sanctification, sometimes to glorification, sometimes to all three rolled up together. And if you'll remember that and look at it in context, it'll help you to understand as you're reading the, the New Testament for yourself. But we need to be saved. We need to be rescued from sin because we're sinners, evil, separated from God, dead in our trespasses and sins. That's what a Christian worldview would say. And like I say, if you espouse naturalism, uh, you're going to take a totally different approach and you're certainly uh, not going to need a Savior. Uh, you can you know, solve your own problems at that point, although we know that doesn't work. People end up with functional Saviors, uh, you know, trying to find meaning and purpose and fulfillment in these kind of things, which are really idols. And, you know, people end up on drugs and alcohol and bad relationships, um, you know, using money or position or status, sometimes using other people to try to fill the hole that is on the inside of them. But second, we see in this passage that salvation is a gracious gift from God. 
Grace literally means unmerited favor or undeserved uh, blessing. It refers to the fact that we deserve judgment, but Jesus took our punishment so we're not condemned. and We become children of God, blessed with every spiritual blessing. Know that this is a gift from God. It's something we can't earn. Uh, grace and works are mutually exclusive. And, and remember that, that every other religion is a religion of works. Only biblical Christianity is a religion of grace that's based on what Christ has done for us, not what we do for Him. And so that means, and, and we also see this in this verse, that salvation is received through faith. John Sott writes, Not works, but grace. Not law, but faith. Not our righteous deeds, but His mercy. There is no cooperation here between God and us, only a choice between two mutually exclusive ways, His and ours. Moreover, the faith which justifies is emphatically not another work. Now to say justification by faith is merely another way of saying justification by Christ. Faith has absolutely no value in itself. Its value lies solely in its object. Faith is the eye that looks to Christ, the hand that lays hold of Him, the mouth that drinks the water of life. And in, in genuine saving faith, there's three elements. There's knowledge we have to know about Jesus. There's a heart response where we embrace Him and love Him. And then, uh, it, you know, it's an act of the will where we commit ourselves to Christ, where we confess Him as Lord. You know, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. So are you really saved? Are you truly trusting Jesus? Not have you just given mental assent to some facts, but have you embraced Christ in your heart? Have you repented? Has He given you a new heart? Do you love Him and want to serve Him and honor Him? Is Jesus truly Truly, the Lord of your life. Have you publicly uh, confessed Him? Uh, and so that's what it means to be saved, to be redeemed, to be rescued. And that's what we need because we're created by God, made in His image, given the ability to make choices. We've made wrong choices. We've chosen to rebel against Him, which the Bible calls sin. We're all sinners by nature and by choice because God is real and because He's our Creator. We have to answer uh, to Him. We're accountable to Him. But because He's loving and gracious and merciful and kind, He came and He died for us. He rose from the dead. And so therefore, there is salvation found only in the name of Jesus. But thankfully, whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved will be saved. Praise His great name. So are you trusting Jesus? But when we trust Jesus, um, that's only the beginning of our relationship with God. And so God wants us to know Him, to serve Him. He wants to use us. He's got a purpose for us now. And then someday He's going to take us to be at His right hand where there's joy, there's pleasures forevermore. We're going to experience Him. There is an afterlife. So uh, let's, let's talk about those two things. So those of us who are saved are called to be God's agents of change in the world individually and then collectively as the church. We're citizens of His kingdom who are called to advance His kingdom. Um, and I want us to think about what that looks like, but let's read a passage of Scripture, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you're also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now it says here we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So let's define some terms and we're going to let Greek scholar uh, Kenneth Weiss define these terms for us. And, and so um, strangers refers to an alien. And so sinners are aliens to the kingdom of God, having a totally depraved nature that makes them different and different in a hostile sense. Foreigners, is, it, he says, speaks of one who has a home alongside of someone else. It is used here of one who comes from another country or city and settles in another, but does not rank as a citizen. 
And then the idea of fellow citizens is members of a city or state speaks of belonging together to God's kingdom. So uh, the, the big idea here then is that we are united together in the church as citizens of God's kingdom. Now, what does that mean, especially practically, and how does that relate to us being God's agents of restoration in the world? Well, let's, let's think about the, the meaning of the kingdom of God. Think about how it's manifested. So there's a past manifestation, a present and a future. Past was when Jesus the King came to earth the first time. In the future, it's when Jesus the King comes back to earth and sets up his kingdom on the earth. But the, the, the present aspect is that Christ is ruling and reigning in the hearts of believers. So in a sense, his kingdom is here. His presence is here through uh, us in, in, in one sense. Now, of course, there's another sense where God's omnipresent. You know, he's everywhere present, but his kingdom is here working through uh, us. The, the Bible tells us Colossians 1, 13 and 14, we've been transferred, uh, translated from uh, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. Uh, paraphrase. Now, we need to define the kingdom. And so there's two key aspects to defining the kingdom of God. Uh, one is God's reign. Um, a kingdom is a ruler's sphere of authority. Charles Colson has written, The kingdom of God is a rule, not a realm. It is the declaration of God's absolute sovereignty, of His total order of life in this world and the next. So God's authority is both universal over the entire world, in particular in the lives of those who confess Jesus as their God, Lord, and King. Now, I'm laying a foundation here, but we're going somewhere. And I think this is, is a foundational concept to live how God wants us to live, to understand how He wants the world uh, to work, you know, to order our lives under the Lordship of Christ, to live according to a Christian worldview, a huge part of that is understanding we're under God's reign, we're a part of His kingdom, and we're to live out His kingdom then in every sphere of life, to bring His reign, His rule, His righteousness to bear on every sphere and every domain of uh, society uh, for, for Him uh, to, to work through us, for us to su submit to Him and allow Him to work through us as His agents of restoration in the world. And so that's the, the second aspect of defining the kingdom of God is, is God's restoration of us as individuals and then through us His restoration of His created world. Uh, Mark Driscoll and Gary Brashear is right, and it's simplest. The kingdom of God is the result of God's mission to rescue and renew His sin-marred creation. The kingdom of God is about Jesus our King establishing His rule and reign over all creation, defeating the human and angelic evil powers, bringing order to all, enacting justice, and being worshipped as Lord. And so that's going to happen completely, perfectly in the millennial reign of Christ, in the future aspect when the King comes back. But it's our job, it's our role right now to be living under the authority, the rule, the reign of the King, our Lord Jesus Christ, for Him to be living and working through us. So His rule and reign, justice, uh, the, his, the worship of Him is being spread to as many people and societies a, a, as, as possible. He's working through the church to bring this uh, about. And, and so, you know, we as the church, are members of the kingdom. The church is those who, the, who through the cross have been reconciled to the Father, made alive in Christ, and, and are indwelled by the Spirit. These people are united together in one body as one new humanity and are citizens of God's kingdom. And, and so, Hopefully, and, and, and I really read through this, talk through this in your groups. But so we've, we've defined the kingdom, just touched on just in the members of the kingdom. That's kind of laying a foundation to lead us to the mission of the kingdom, this idea of, of restoration. So um, how are the church and kingdom related? And then what is the mission of the church in light of the mission of uh, the, the kingdom? 
And, and so, once again, Driscoll and Brashears write, The church is not the kingdom. In recent years, many theologians have come to a consensus that the kingdom is, is to be thought of as the reign of God and, and the exercise of His authority. The church, by contrast, is a realm of God, the people who are under His rule. George Eldon Ladd, a leader in forging this consensus, says, The church is the community of the kingdom, but never the ki kingdom itself. This consensus is called inaugurated eschatology, the idea that the kingdom is both here uh, uh, now in some senses and still to come in its fullness, referring to when Jesus comes back. Some connect church and kingdom too closely, believing the kingdom is here in its fullness now. This is called an overrealized eschatology, which identifies kingdom with church, as many Roman Catholics and some millennialists do. Others see the kingdom exclusively future as something Jesus will establish when he returns. This is an underrealized eschatology, which disconnects kingdom and church completely as in older dispensational premillennialism. Practically, this world still has sin, sinners, the devil, and demons, but does not yet have Jesus ruling on the earth with a rod of iron. Subsequently, a na naively optimistic, overrealized eschatology that thinks we can fix all the world's problems and usher in utopia is an extreme error. Conversely, a gloomy, pessimistic, underrealized eschatology that thinks we can't make a difference in the world as the church by the power of the gospel is also an extreme error. This tension of the kingdom being already present in the church, but not yet fully unveiled uh, until the return of Jesus, allows us to labor in hope until He returns by working on both the spiritual and physical needs of people, caring for the whole person, including their food, water, shelter, education, and clothing. The kingdom message is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Spiritual death, the rupture of relationship with God, can be healed through His atoning death alone. The internal destruction sin has brought to our hearts can be renewed through the power of His resurrected life. The real enemy conquered by His victory is not political, but sin and the God of this world, Satan himself, along with the spiritual forces of darkness. Jesus formed a new movement, the church, a redeemed people from every nationality and ethnicity who will come into the unity of the Spirit to participate in God's rescue mission to the whole world. Agents of Restoration. Martin Luther King Jr. in Letter from a Birmingham Jail said it this way, There was a time when the church was very powerful. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores, meaning the customs of society. And oh, that we would be that today, that we as individuals, we as the church would be God's agents of reconciliation and, and, and restoration in uh, the world. And, and so when we put all this together, three then practical applications uh, of this for us as the church is one, the church is doing battle against the kingdom of darkness. If we're going to be a part of restoring this fallen world of seeing men and women's lives redeemed and restored and changed. If, if, if we're going to see justice, if we're going to give hope, we have to understand that we're in a battle, a spiritual battle against the kingdom of darkness, that it's spiritual warfare, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in the spiritual places. It's, it's, it's a prayer battle that we're going to have to approach this to the church participates in God's rescue mission of the world through the gospel. So it's going to take evangelism. It's going to take missions. But three, the church is to be a picture of the coming kingdom, meaning that we're going to have to live it out in our lives individually. We're going to have, but we're going to have to bring it to bear on every aspect, domain, element of society. So wherever you work, you're God's agent of restoration there. You're there to bring the kingdom of God to that place. You're there to bring God's rule and reign and righteousness. You're there to demonstrate the lordship of Christ, school, job, neighborhood, wherever you are. We're, we're called to be a picture of the kingdom of God, not a picture of the kingdom of darkness. 
We're called to be used by God, not just to sit back and, and, and wait on heaven, but to make a difference in the world. Uh, what hope does the world have apart from the kingdom of God? You see, the world, to quote Mark Sayers again, wants to build a kingdom without the king. But that kingdom is always going to fall apart. The only way to really experience the kingdom, the only way to really experience the life that God designed us for and that He wants us to have is under the Lordship of Christ. Only a Christian worldview corresponds to reality. And only we can bring that about as God's agents, as members of His kingdom, building His kingdom in the world. Let's make a difference now. But let's do it in light of the hope of heaven, knowing that this world is not the end. And so to finish all this up, let's spend a few minutes talking about the afterlife. Is there an afterlife? What happens when I die? And really, there's only so many options when it comes to answering this question. Naturalism teaches that we came from nothing and are going nowhere except to the grave because we have no soul. So there's only a physical existence, which means there can't be life after death. Therefore, the action that course, uh, properly corresponds with that philosophy is getting everything out of this world that you can because this life is it. Uh, you know, some Eastern religions teach reincarnation, which Webster's online dictionary defines as rebirth in new bodies or forms of life, especially a rebirth of a soul in a new human body. Um, you know, is that true? Is that an option? Uh, many religions teach us that some form of heaven by being good enough, doing enough good deeds, or following the religion closely enough. It's not what the Bible teaches, but that's kind of the standard religious thing. Some teach universalism, that everybody makes it there. Uh, Roman Catholicism teaches that most people go to purgatory, which is kind of in an intermediate state. But biblical Christianity teaches that we make it to heaven by the grace of God through faith in Jesus, but, but that those who reject Him go to hell. Uh, but if, if the Bible's true and naturalism is false, if we have a soul, that means that this life is preparation for eternity. So we better live in light of that fact. I mean, what we believe about death and the afterlife is one of the most guiding uh, principles of our lives on the earth. Rick Warren says, life on earth is just the dress rehearsal before the real production. You will spend far more time on the other side of death in eternity than you will here. Earth is the staging area, the preschool, the tryout for your life in eternity. It is the practice workout before the actual game, the warm-up lap before the race begins. This life is preparation for the next. Death is not your termination, but your transition into eternity. So there are eternal consequences to everything you do on earth. So what do you believe about the afterlife? Do you believe there is one? Or are you ready to go there? You know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has put eternity in our hearts. It's why maybe even uh, people, uh, you know, who say there is no God can fear death. I mean, and part of that's just, you know, the whole idea of the unknown and being sick and getting dead and all that. But, um, you know, there's just something there. You know, what's going to happen? Am I going to have to answer to God? You know, the Bible says, pointing out to man, man wants to die and then the judgment. So what actually happens when I die? Well, I believe that Jesus is the one who is qualified to speak to that because He came from heaven, came to earth, rose from the dead and went back to heaven. He's been in eternity and his resurrection proves that he's the son of God and therefore the expert on everything. And he put it this way in Luke chapter 16. He says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which is a synonym uh, for heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in, in, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. 
Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And so I think there's five basic truths that we see in the words of Jesus here that I want to share with you quickly as we close. Number one, our eternal destiny is not determined by our external earthly condition. It's determined by the heart and not by external factors. Number two, our eternal destiny is a place of continual conscious existence. When I go back to the dust, we're not annihilated, we're immortal. We're not going to be in some kind of soul sleep. We're going to consciously exist somewhere forever. Number three, our eternal destiny is a fixed state. There's no second chances. Wherever we go, whether it's heaven or hell, we're going to stay there. Thomas Hobbes said, hell is truth seen too late. Eleanor Roosevelt said, life is like a parachute jump. You've got to get it right the first time. Number four, our eternal destiny is either heaven or hell. The Bible does not speak of purgatory. Jesus allows for no middle ground here. And it certainly doesn't allow for the doctrine of universalism that everybody's going to eventually be saved. We see here that hell is a place of physical suffering. It's a place of continual awareness of blessings and opportunities lost. It's a place of separation from the presence of God. It's, it's unimaginably horrible. Heaven is paradise. It's the abode of the saints of God. It is a place of comfort and blessing in the glory of God. And then we see number, the number five, our eternal destiny is determined by a response to the word of God. In John 5, 46 and 47, Jesus said, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how you, will you believe my words? Uh, Jesus Christ is the one who rose from the dead. And, and, and you know, that is our sign from God, according to Matthew 12, 40. So have you responded to the good news of Jesus that he died for you and rose from the dead? Are you trusting in him? And then are you living every day to prepare for the final day? Or are you laying up treasures in heaven? Are you prepared for death? Um, let me close with this quote and then you can discuss it in your groups. Rick Warren wrote this. He said, the only time most people think about eternity is at funerals. And then it's often shallow, sentimental thinking based on ignorance. You may feel it's morbid to think about death, but it's actually unhealthy to live in denial of death and not consider what is inevitable. Only a fool will go through life uh, unprepared for what we all know will eventually happen. You need to think more about eternity, not less. Are you ready?